World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations, as well as leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's Doug Edwards. German troops are evacuating the Mediterranean island of Sardinia while the fighting on the Italian mainland continues to go well for the American Fifth Army. Prime Minister Churchill has returned to Great Britain. American Ambassador Stanley has suddenly left Moscow and is en route to Washington for consultations. On the Russian fighting front, the Red Army continues to make tremendous gains. They're 30 miles from Smolensk, and they've recaptured Krasnograd. And in the Pacific... American forces have carried out a heavy attack on Jap targets in the Gilbert Islands. Now, for our first news direct from overseas, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Algiers. Winston Burbett reporting. The Fifth Army continues to make steady progress on the whole of the Salerno Gulf Front. The Allied offensive, which started last Thursday morning, has driven a broad salient in the central sector and bent the German lines back to a point 12 miles inland in the south. German resistance is officially said to be weakening down on that southern flank, which is just as one would expect as it is there that the 5th and 8th Armies meet. Today, the main force of the 8th Army is piling up the coast road to join the 5th in one solid front. The three Allied armies are closing in, straightening and shortening their line across the breadth of Italy. From the Taranto area and from Bari on the east coast, there is nothing to report. But we expect to have good news from that sector very soon. In the days to come, as our forces drive against the German Salerno positions from the south and east, and as reinforcements for the 5th Army keep pouring in in increasing numbers, our first large-scale land offensive should really begin to roll. There'll be a considerable German force against us, backed by huge supply dumps throughout the Naples area. What we have met on the Salerno beachheads is just the beginning. One significant development in the past two days is that the enemy has begun digging in and building fixed machine gun posts at many points. He may be preparing to abandon his recent mobile tactics and try a more static kind of defense. He may be preparing to withdraw the main body of his forces from the Salerno area, leaving an artillery screen to hold us in check. Already he has begun to thin out, and there have been no reports of German counterattacks over the weekend. The Luftwaffe also has been showing less and less fight over the Salerno battlefront. Yesterday, while our bombers and fighters were wrecking scores of German aircraft on the ground, the Luftwaffe had practically vanished from southern Italy. We still have no further details about fighting in Sardinia. Two Italian divisions are credited with chasing the Germans off the island to further trouble in Corsica. The Germans had very few troops in Sardinia, apart from air troops, and even these have been singularly inactive recently. Every day for the past month, our patrols have been ranging up and down the Sardinian coast, trying to scare up a dogfight, looking for trouble and finding none. The place has been dead. Just now, Sardinia will probably not be of very great use to us, and its fall will have no great effect on the course of the Italian campaign. True, its four large airfields are only 300 miles from the land, which theoretically is as good as having an airfield just outside Rome. But our long-range bombers can operate even more effectively from better-developed bases on the Italian mainland. I return you now to CBS in New York. More news in just a moment. But first, here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. There's a story that's being told of two student flyers, how they became battle-tested veterans the hard way. It's a typical story in which radio equipment, Admiral equipment perhaps, plays an important part. Two young pilots were getting their final instruction in Africa. The finishing touches before being sent into actual combat. While on a routine training flight, over the radio came the sudden sharp warning, enemy bomber at six o'clock. For a moment, both boys calmly assumed that the instructor was indulging in a bit of leg pulling. But looking down, they saw a huge Nazi bomber streaking in just over the water. Jolted into action by an eye full of the real thing, they whirled their planes into a screaming dive. A press of a button, and three cannon shells ripped into the enemy ship. For a split second, nothing happened. Then a terrific explosion, and all that remained of the enemy bomber was a shattered tail assembly, slowly sinking into the sea. On many battlefronts in such real-life dramas, Admiral Goat Equipment is playing a leading role. 
Admiral research engineers fully appreciate their responsibility to our fighting men, are devoting all their skill and ingenuity to building rugged, dependable instruments of communication. And after the war, when Admiral can again return to civilian production, the knowledge gained now will be yours in the peacetime, Admiral, America's smart set. Now, here once again is Doug Edwards. In Western Europe, Allied planes are again hammering the continent, and Prime Minister Churchill has returned home after his conferences in this country. Now, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS London, Charles Collingwood reporting. Winston Churchill is back home. The British Prime Minister has returned to help open the new session of Parliament. He will find the legislators in a mood both admiring and questioning. They, like the people for whom they speak, want to know from Mr. Churchill, first of all, about Italy. Not about the progress of the 5th and 8th armies. The British have no trouble reading communiques. What they want to know is what happened between the fall of Mussolini and the invasion of Italy. General opinion is that we missed a chance. Not since North Africa has there been such a unanimous querying of official policy. I don't want to give you a lot of quotations, Doubtless American papers are saying much the same things. But on the left in Britain, it is said that we delayed in Italy because we are afraid of unleashing the forces of Italian radical democracy. On the right, they are saying that we just delayed. But from right to left, they think something went wrong. When Winston Churchill gets through with the international situation, he's going to find himself confronted here for the first time with a serious situation on the home front. Up till now, Britain's home front problems have been easily handled by economists and administrators. The government produced a plan, and the people carried it out. No one really noticed, as we do in America, the separation between internal problems and war problems. But now there is beginning to be trouble on the industrial front. The strike rate is going up. There are grumblings on all sides over the operation of Britain's wartime labor policy. Employers say that there is no longer any discipline now that their power to hire and fire is gone. Workers complain about the fixing of their wages, about being arbitrarily transferred to lower paid and less attractive work. And they say that they've lost their last weapon when their right to strike is denied. This situation is most dramatic in the coal fields where last week more than 30,000 miners were out on strike. Britain's coal output continues to drop. They can't get new men to go down into the mines by just asking them. And miners strike when the government tries to compel boys to take up coal mining. It's a difficult position. As Britain goes into the fifth winter of the war, it is coal and not food which has become the great home problem. I return you now to New York. Allied planes from the Middle East have again attacked Italy. There are new reports of impending action in the Balkans by Allied forces. For a direct report from this war zone, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Cairo, James Fleming reporting. Today's Middle East air communiques tell of intense bomber and fighter activity during the last 48 hours. In an air battle over the eastern Mediterranean yesterday, fighter planes of the Royal Air Force encountered formations of German bomber and fighter aircraft. When the scrap was over... The RAF fighters had sent five Junkers 88 bombers and two Messerschmitt 109 fighters to their destruction. Last night, Wellington bombers were over the largest island of the Dodecanese group, Rhodes. Here they attacked the important enemy-held aerodrome of Marita, starting a fire among the buildings on the field. Friday night, Liberator and Halifax bombers attacked Foggia in eastern Italy. The RAF reports three aircraft missing from these and other operations. By daylight Saturday, heavy liberators of the 9th U.S. Air Force struck out against Pasteur, the important communication center of eastern Italy. Once again, the target was the railway yards, a vital part of Germany's transport system within Italy. Dropping over 70 tons of high explosives, the liberators blanketed the yards with bursts. A number of the explosions were followed by heavy black smoke fires. All aircraft returned safely from this operation. War can be wacky at times. There's the case of the flying parrot. Here in Cairo, there's a young flight lieutenant who has as an inseparable companion a gaily plumed parrot that he carries about perched on his shoulder. It's a moody, silent bird, this parrot, not given to careless chatter. 
And probably for good reason. For rumor has it that he's accompanied his master on more than one hazardous mission. Here, then, is a priceless opportunity for some enterprising publisher. If he can sign up this bird, he's got a story. Then there was that mechanic in the RAF from South Africa, a lad named Tailspin Carter. The other day, in a display of epic bad judgment, he somehow got astride the tail of a Spitfire just as it was taking off. For some nine and a half minutes, he hung on for dear life. The pilot, noticing that his aircraft was behaving strangely, took a look through his rearview mirror. For a moment, he thought he'd acquired a giant gremlin. Then he recognized the hitchhiker, banked his machine so the weight of his passenger was taken by the rudder, and made a perfect three-point landing. Tailspin Carter was okay, though a little windblown and plenty scared. This is James Fleming in Cairo. I now return you to New York. For a discussion of the situation on the Russian battlefields, here is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. The collapse of German resistance at the key fortress of Bryansk appears to have weakened the defensive structure of the whole German front in central Russia. Very rapid Russian advances, both northwest and southwest of Bryansk, have followed. And now a new drive, aimed directly at Smolensk, has opened with a capture just announced by Premier Stalin in a special order of the day, of the towns of Dukovshina and Yartsevo, approximately 30 miles northeast of Smolensk. This constitutes a double threat to Smolensk, direct pressure by the new advance and the danger that Roslavl, bastion of Smolensk on the south, may be taken by the Russians pushing out from fallen Bryansk. Farther south, the Russians yesterday reported the capture of Pavlograd, and today, that of Krasnograd. These are two of the most important of the group of railway junctions just east of the great bend of the Dnieper River. Also yesterday, the Russians cut the kiev Poltava railway at Murgorod. This latter Russian gain leaves all of the forces east of Murgorod, that is, all the German troops east of the Dnieper River all the way down to the Sea of Azov, dependent entirely on bridges over the Dnieper for supply and reinforcement or for withdrawal. The German lines in this area now roughly parallel the curving course of the Great River and are from 25 to 40 miles distant from it. Toward the river bridges, the Germans seem to be retiring along their whole front, and there seems a likelihood that the Russians will cut off and capture considerable numbers of these retreating Germans. This likelihood is increased by the Russian capture of the German delaying force at Kryluki, which has been surrounded for the last two or three days, but has been holding out strongly so far. One important strategic result which the Russians may gain in the south is the retaking of the Crimea, from which the Romanian oil fields could be bombed at a range of something like 300 miles. The Russians are now only about 35 miles from the one remaining railway which serves the German garrison of the Crimea. And the retaking of Novorossiysk has given the Russian Black Sea Fleet a good harbor and thus afforded them considerably increased freedom of action. This may permit of the launching of amphibious operations against the German forces in the Crimea, such as those by which the Russians last winter recovered the port of Kerch and Theodosia and for a time threatened to surround and destroy the German besiegers of Sevastopol. It must also be remembered that the recovery of the Crimea by the Russians would have very considerable effects both in the Balkans and in Turkey, already greatly disturbed from the Axis viewpoint by the surrender of Italy. That was Major George Fielding Elliott. American forces have carried out a new heavy attack on Jap Islands in the Central Pacific. For details and an indication of what kind of fighting the Navy is looking forward to, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. The Pacific Fleet carried out its obvious intention of hitting the Jap regularly and in strength by attacking in the Gilbert Island group Saturday night and Sunday, East Longitude Time. A communique released late last night by Admiral Chester W. Nimitz here at Pearl Harbor said strong Pacific Ocean area forces conducted heavy raids on the Jap bases at Tarawa Island in the northern Gilbert group and on Nauru Island west of the Gilberts. These operations were carried out according to plan during the night preceding and for a good portion of the day of September 19th, East Longitude Time. Details of the operation are not immediately available. With the war in the Pacific into its 21st month, the United States Navy has given strong indication that it expects no quick or easy victory. Two items point this up. Another new dry dock for repair of warships has just been completed 
at Pearl Harbor and will be dedicated this week. The Navy is increasing its hospital facilities here in Hawaii to meet an increased uh, wounded as the war mounts in Temple. There's every indication that the Pacific Fleet is preparing to strike at the Japs regularly and in strength. The fleet is ready and able to do this at any point from the far north all the way to the East Indies, perhaps in more than one place in quick one-two blows. The bulk of the Navy is in the Pacific stronger than at any time in the nation's history. The surrender of the Italian fleet releases British sea strength from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean, thus further stretching the already wide coverage of the now defense-minded Jap fleet. This factor undoubtedly has played an important part in the plans of strategy mapped out by Admiral Nimitz and his staff for the coming fall. The United States Navy now dominates better than three-fourths of the Pacific Ocean area. That portion controlled by the Japs, however, contains the greater portion of the Pacific Islands. These, as has often been pointed out, are stationary aircraft carriers. Since the turn of the tide, our forces have obtained some of these stationary carriers, the Solomons, the Aleutians, and in our newly won portions of New Guinea. Ours, however, is still the long haul. I have seen a considerable portion of the Pacific Fleet's might in and out of Pearl Harbor, and it is of comforting size and strength. These warships are not out here for defense purposes. That our fleet can and will attack is shown by the recent Marcus Island offensive, less than a thousand miles from Japan, and this we attack on the Gilberts. It's reasonable to expect more such attacks from now on and regularly. This is Webley Edwards in Honolulu. I return you now to New York. Here in our New York studio is Larry Meyer, war correspondent who has just returned from the southwest Pacific area, where he broadcast for CBS World News. He was right on the scene when our troops landed on Nassau Beach in their drive against Salamawa and Lai. And he left the war zone only two weeks ago when American and Australian forces were entering the final stages of their successful offensive against the Jap strongholds. What's the situation there now, Larry? After two years of struggle in the Pacific, the picture at last is beginning to look more favorable. That is true, especially in the air. Actually, land operations in the Salamaua area have been on a minor scale, although we really have been doing a mighty splendid job with the equipment we have. But really big land drives are still impossible because we have not yet sent sufficient men and material out there. And how did we win at Salamaua and Lake? Well, our successes were due to the skill of our soldiers our superior equipment, our air coverage, and most of all, the element of surprise. Our troops have proved themselves better fighting men than the Japs. And in actual combat, in the muck of the rotting jungle, they have blasted the myth of Japanese superiority in warfare in the tropical wilderness. And when they went after Salamawa and Lei, they sprang a double-barrel surprise. First, we landed troops at Nassau Bay and started thrusting towards Salamaua. While the Japs were concentrating on the defense of that base, we sent out another surprise force on the other side and outflanked them in the lay sector. That was uh, fairly easy going? Not a bit. I can tell you it was no picnic. I've been over that ground on bombing missions. I've hiked through the jungles and mountains with the troops and swung around Huan Gulf on barges and patrol torpedo boats. The natural obstacles are heartbreaking, and the Japs resisted bitterly. Yet we succeeded in opening a new phase of war, offensive war, in the southwest Pacific. Are there any other factors in our success? Yes, superiority in the air. General MacArthur, in a recent talk I had with him, confirmed our superiority. We have scored great blows at Wewak, Medang, and other enemy bases. Besides, we are getting more and more fighter and bomber planes out there. But probably the most important element is the plain fact that our flyers themselves are vastly superior to the Japs. The score in our favor now is nearly ten to one. Well, Larry, we seem to be doing all right so far. How about future operations? Well, General MacArthur has never become fully reconciled to the idea of winning the war in Europe first. Naturally, he has to fit in his policies with the world strategy of the Allied High Command. But he can use the men and equipment he has to their utmost advantage. And even with his limited resources, he hits the Japs where he can and whenever he can. Where do you think the next blow will fall? Many observers look for a land, sea, and air assault on the Japanese naval base at Rabaul. Yet the first really big blow may come at some far distant point least suspected by the Japs. That was Larry Meyer, one of Columbia's correspondents in the Southwest Pacific. 
In this country, Ambassador Stanley's return home from Moscow and a new discussion on the future of General Marshall are attracting major attention. For details, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Washington, Robert Lewis reporting. The departure from Moscow of American Ambassador Stanley is expected to further the arrangements for the three-party meeting of American, British, and Russian representatives in the near future. The State Department yesterday had announced that Stanley was returning for the purpose of making a personal report to Secretary Hull and President Roosevelt. And although there is speculation in some quarters that Stanley's return is the answer to the sudden recall of the Russian ambassador from Washington last month, it's generally considered here that that is not the reason for this new move. However, it's not known whether Stanley will return to Moscow, but if he doesn't, it's felt that the reasons will be personal and not political. Those recurring rumors, both here and in London, that General Marshall, the Army's Chief of Staff, would soon be appointed to the post of Allied Commander-in-Chief in Europe, has drawn the fire of the Army and Navy Journal, the semi-official magazine of the services. In an editorial, the journal scoffed at reports that such an appointment would be a promotion, saying that powerful interests would like to see Marshall removed from his present position and a man more sympathetic to their interests appointed. Another opinion here in Washington closely follows that of the journal. Marshall is considered tops. On the home front, there are rumors that Prentice Brown is about to resign as chief of the OPA, but these reports are strictly rumors and based principally on Brown's long absence from his desk here in Washington. In Congress, final consideration of the Wheeler bill to defer the drafting of fathers may be postponed from Tuesday to some day later in the week due to the inability to get recent testimony printed in time. But regardless of this delay, it's freely predicted here that the senators will not pass the bill. Over in the House, Representative Joseph Martin, the Republican leader, says that if the Senate does reject the Wheeler bill, it will remove any necessity for House consideration. But regardless of the fate of the bill, Martin says that he plans to start action soon to increase the allowances granted to soldiers' dependents by 20%. And now back to CBS New York. Premier Stalin and the third order of the day has just announced that Soviet troops have captured the junction of Lubny on the poltava Kiev Railroad. And now here's Warren Sweeney. You've heard many stories of the part radio. Much of it admiral-built equipment is playing on our battlefields. But what are the training programs of our troops here at home? An interesting plan for furthering the use of radio in this important work was recently revealed. Manning an anti-aircraft battery, for example, is a highly technical precision operation. Naturally, the more realistic the target, the more skilled the men will be when faced with actual battle conditions. Kites have been used, as well as sleeves towed by training planes. Miniature gliders have also been released high in the air to serve as objects for anti-aircraft fire. Experiments are now being made with model planes driven by actual motors and entirely guided and controlled by radio. New instruments, improvements on the old, new applications of radio and electronics. These are the problems that have become a constant challenge to admiral engineers and research technicians. Not until after the war will we fully appreciate the changes, present improvements, and new developments will make in our daily lives. Even now, Admiral is making long-range plans for conversion to peacetime production, and many wartime advances have already been assigned important roles in the new Admiral America Smart Set. Women of America... With the manpower needs of our country expanding daily, there is an urgent necessity for workers in the war-supporting industries that will keep our war workers healthy, well-fed, and well-clothed. Experience is not necessary. Even though you've never worked at a job, there is a place for you now in the service of your country. The job may not be glamorous. It may be clerking in a grocery store or taking care of a neighbor's children. But if by so doing, you can release one skilled worker to fill one vacant place in a war plant, you will bring the day of victory a little closer. Join us next week at this same time. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Rigby Building, Chicago.